Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, I uh, I got through my Yom Kippur fast just just fine yesterday. Not as life changing as as last year's edition, as as far as I can tell. But I am sort of shot out of a cannon right now, even if I don't sound like it. Um, so I think I I found something during that that twenty four plus hours of of fasting and and reading and and caffeine withdrawal, which is always the the toughest part for me. And as I mentioned during this week's show, I um, I seem to be in kind of a, a fluid state lately, or at least one that permits all sorts of, uh, we'll say, transformations. I don't know how healthy that is, but uh, or or even how illusory the the transformations are. But you know, I'll I'll keep whirling through it and see what happens. Now, this weekend, I am off to CXC or Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, the comics festival co-founded by my late friend Tom Spurgeon. And I've got some really good podcasts lined up for that weekend, but also a lot of reading to get done before I, I get out there, um, you know, so I don't come off as a dope when I'm, I'm sitting down with these great guests. But you'll hear more about that next week. For now, let's get to this week's show. And my guest this time is Patrick McDonnell, the great cartoonist behind the daily comic strip Mutts, which is approaching its 30th anniversary. And Patrick has a, a brand new book out now called The Superhero's Journey from Abrams Comic, uh, Abrams Comic Arts in association with Marvel. And now is September 26, 2023 for you time travelers out there. Now, the um, the superhero's journey is well, it's, it's kind of tough to describe. I mean, it's a graphic novel or a, a big comic, however you want to describe it. But um, it begins with an autobiographical framing sequence um, about Patrick's childhood and his discovery of, of great comic books of uh, the 1960s before segging into a, a superhero story like I've never seen and one that I found very affecting, I'll say. Now, Patrick uses panels and pages from existing Marvel comics, like the original uh, stuff, from the 1960s and, and interweaves his own panels in his own drawing style to tell a story that is a uh, <laughs> fantastic um if you know patrick's work from mutts and especially some of the books he's illustrated you'll guess that the story is going to get at the uh what the heart of the universe and and the self and, and how best to live in it and he does a, a wonderful job of using these touchstone momentous comics of his childhood to bring about a moment of transcendence um, where he he takes the sort of familiar trope of of heroes fighting each other and the the looming menace of a, a Doctor Doom and a Galactus and, and other figures to explore what we're really fighting. And he gets at the that that child's allure of these these four color adventures and how we can build on those to to get at something greater in our lives. How you know? Yeah, we cast off the the childish things, but they're they leave roots, and he builds on those in, in this in a really wonderful way. And he he does it all through the device of a conversation between the characters, Mister Fantastic and the Watcher, uh, who any Marvel fans will will recognize, and the rest of you will be completely oblivious to. But anyway, um, what I want to say is it, it's not a solemn book. I'm not making it out like it's this big, dreary mess. It is a, a really fun comic, The Superhero's Journey. And there are moments that made me bust a gut laughing, um, followed by pages that really, like I say, touched me, that, that reframed my mind and how I understand uh, a purpose and, and purposefulness. Like I said, I'm, I'm in a kind of fluid state lately, but I don't think it was just that. I, th I think Patrick accomplishes something really, really special with this book. And I enjoy the heck out of it and the way Patrick just 
pays tribute to the the great imagination of of Jack Kirby and and Steve Ditko and obligatory joke about Don Heck. Um, but anyway, do yourself a favor. Go get The Superhero's Journey out now from Abrams Comic Arts. Now, Patrick and I were supposed to get together earlier this year, but things got weird and, and we never connected. That time, we were going to talk about his other 2023 book, Heart to Heart, a conversation on love and hope for our precious planet. And that's from Harper One. In that book, Patrick integrates the words of the Dalai Lama and his own cartooning to uh, Patrick's own cartooning, not the Dalai Lama's, uh, to, to bring us this this urgent message about saving the world. It's a beautiful book, and the, the artwork is is minimal and, and gorgeous, and um, it just made me drool in its, its Zen perfection, as is going to come up in the, the conversation. Um, but Patrick does an amazing job there of of finding the the right moments in, in or the right words in the Dalai Lama's past uh, uh, speeches or, or books, and integrating that into this ecological message and crafting a story that that runs with it uh, as a Dalai Lama and a, a panda bear talk about the state of the world. So check that one out too. Oh, and the <laughs> the other book uh, that we talk about came out in 2019. And at the time, we figured, well, we'll just get around to recording that in 2020. Um, but of course, things happened. That one is The Art of Nothing, 25 Years of Mutts and the Art of Patrick McDonald, which is also from Abrams. That's an amazing book about Patrick's work with, with sketches and originals and all sorts of behind-the-scenes stuff of what went into a quarter century of making the comic strip mutts, as well as all the the other art Patrick has made over the years. He's taken up painting uh, and made some amazing canvases, which we talk about during this this show, too. And Well, anyway, we had a, plenty to catch up on, and the episode only covers an hour of that. But trust me, we spent time before and after just gabbing and and we went out for a wonderful day getting lunch uh ice cream and and more conversation and my wife uh came along for this one and patrick's wife karen you know rounded out our 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 non-podcast squad uh where we could let our hair down figuratively and and just shoot the breeze and it was it was a really wonderful day and one that um just at the beginning of the high holidays made me feel like i've I've actually lived a pretty good life if I've got friends like these two. Oh, um, I should also tell you, um, there's going to be a follow-up to this episode uh, with a live conversation between Patrick and me at the Princeton Public Library in Princeton, New Jersey, on Saturday, October 28th at 3 p.m. Um, he's a lot of fun to talk with. I am betting we go in some different directions than we did in this conversation. I'll probably focus on the superhero's journey, but, uh, well, we'll see where it all goes. Anyway, that's October 28th, 2023. Now, here's Patrick's bio from the book. Patrick McDonald is the best-selling author, illustrator, playwright, painter, and creator of the comic strip Mutts, which appears in more than 700 newspapers around the world. He has received numerous awards internationally, including a Caldecott Honor and the Rubin, the highest honor given by the National Cartoonist Society. The Art of Nothing, a career-spanning monograph, was published by Abrams Comic Arts in 2019. In 2023, he published Heart to Heart and The Superhero's Journey. He lives in New Jersey. And now, the 2023 Virtual Memories Conversation with Patrick McDonald. So tell me about the secret origin of the superhero's journey. <laughs> the secret origin of the superhero's journey. Uh, you know, I had just finished handing in uh, the Heart to Heart book, the uh, book collaboration I with the, did with the Dalai Lama. And I was kind of thinking, boy, what, what do you do after that? And uh, actually it was in Ohio. I had a, a painting show of my paintings in Ohio State, and Charlie Kochman came to the show. Yeah. And uh, he asked me if, you know, Abrams had a deal with Marvel to do, you know, books on the Marvel superheroes. And Charlie asked me, would I ever be interested 
and doing and a you book. You said, would I ever be interested? <laughs> <laughs> it took me two seconds to say, are you kidding me? I, my God, that's a boyhood dream come true. I mean, I've wanted to do that since I was five years old. I never thought about <laughs> doing it for real, but he made it real. So uh, I definitely said yes, having no idea what I was going to do. And actually, I think Charlie at the, at the beginning, um, I think he was, you know, they also, Abrams also does children books based on the Marvel superheroes. And mm. I think he was thinking because I do children books that that might be where I go. But I, I told him, no, no, if I do a superhero book, I want to do a superhero book. So, uh, you know, he just started a line with uh, Alex Ross as the curator of called Marvel Arts, where they wanted to do new and different Stories, so he, he thought whatever I do would would work in that yeah. line because I'm sure it would be new and different, and uh, and then I had the chance to play with uh, all the heroes I loved as a kid. Yeah, and tell me about uh, you know how it came together in terms of developing it as a we'll say as a story. Mm-hmm. You know, you start with autobiographical elements and you're fusing pages and and panels from Marvel books and your own illustration to. To tell something, when did it start to gel for you? When did you know how you know it was going to be? You know, it came in bits and pieces. Um, the two Jack Kirby quotes that start and end the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I read those, I just you know put a little yellow magic marker and underlined <laughs> them, and uh, always thought I could, I would wanted to do something with those. They were just such powerful quotes. So I, I knew if there was a way I could make that part of the story it was. One of the uh, things I was that led me to the story. Uh, the other one was I thought it would be funny. You know, Mister Fantastic always goes into negative zones and different universes. So I thought it would be funny if uh, Mister Fantastic visited all the old comic ads yeah. that were in those books. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that story. Legally, it, it didn't happen except for Grit Magazine, but um, Grit Newspaper. But um, so that was one of the ideas, having Mr. Fantastic go somewhere. Um, I also knew I wanted to include as many characters. You know, <laughs> I had a chance to play with the Marvel <laughs> superheroes. Everyone you could from those days. Yeah, like Charlie said, oh, you want to work with Hulk or Thor? And it was like, no, I want to work with everybody. So, you know, an inspiration was the uh, Fantastic Four number three where Reed and Sue got married and they threw every character yeah, and all the, the characters there for the wedding. So I, I was like, that was an inspiration to somehow come up with a story where I could draw everybody. Um, and with that, you know, Marvel did that so much in those early comics where, you know, there'd be they fantastic forward being guest stars in the Avengers and all that. And, and it was always because of some uh, misunderstanding where they would fight each other. Yeah. So I, I knew because I wanted to use the original panels and pages as part of my story. I, I knew I could find a lot of material of the characters fighting among themselves, yeah. which led to like, well, why are they fighting among themselves? And I thought of the negative zone coming to the, you know, and then just the politics of the day. I mean, I feel like we're all living in the negative zone. So I thought that would be topical to have, you know, heroes fighting heroes and brothers fighting brothers. So, um, I knew that could be a theme in the in the book. Um, I also knew I wanted to use the Watcher because I think the Watcher is such a powerful spiritual character, and yeah. you know, in all my books, I you know the spirituality is real important to me. So I knew the book needed to have that aspect to it. I never in my life would have thought my main main character would be Mister Fantastic. Only because he's so boring. <laughs> I was going to ask, because like the most boring character. Although the most egotistical one, because yes. he came up with the name Mr. <laughs> Mr. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and the three others. You know? <laughs> one that goes literally named The Thing. That's it. But I'm Mr. Fantastic. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's also boring to draw. I mean, he doesn't have a mask. I had to draw a real face. And, uh, you know, of course, I could draw his... Uh, neck big and his arms big and that you know that made it a little more fun but he was also nowhere near as fun to draw as iron man or spider-man so yeah. somehow he became my lead character just because uh you know this this book literally wrote itself yeah you know um you know i guess it's been in my brain and dna for so long that uh 
I just watched it happen. I like I would have never thought the book that came out. I that you couldn't plan. I couldn't be like, oh yeah, I'm going to do that book. It just, I really, you know, it's funny. Speaking of the watcher, I, I felt like I was the watcher. I was witnessing, without interfering, my book happen. Yeah, yeah. It's a the the synthesis that takes place of of again the autobiographical the the comics that are embedded in both of our brains mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know people who've read those those comics devotedly in their we'll say childhood and youth and your spirituality and Buddhism the way things um, the way the Watcher uh, uh, kind of reframes the world as as we know it um, it's all organic and yet. It's it's so crafted throughout in choices of you know what you're drawing versus you know panels you you integrate that remixing those those old panels into to what you're doing and they're out of context but you know feed into the the story that you're trying to tell. I, I can't imagine the um, choosing I guess the choosing those moments where yeah you know an old Kirby panel will actually fit better here than my my trying to explain what's what's <laughs> happening and you know. And of course, you bring in some great Galactus uh, uh, panels, which are yeah. always an absolute joy to, to, to behold when you see Kirby doing Kirby. But, but uh, favorite character to draw in the book? <laughs> uh, I think at the end of the day, it was probably... Oh, well, you know, I, I, I'm not going to have a favorite. Anyone but Mr. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, Iron Man was fun to draw. Spider-Man's always fun to draw. Captain America was fun to draw. Um, and I really did channel my 10 year old self. I, I just did the Baltimore Comic Con and everyone who bought a book got not only my signature, but I, I did a little drawing. That was one of the happiest days of my life. Yeah. I was literally just sitting at a table. <laughs> draw Marvel superheroes all day. <laughs> and you know, I, in my opinion, I can't make a mistake. <laughs> you know, because I, I, it's got that 10 year old energy of like, you don't make mistakes, you just draw, you know? So, uh, yeah, it's it's been a fun experience. Yeah, and you mention it in the the, the the fake letters column in the back of the book. <laughs> the 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 deliberate looseness of the style. Uh, yeah. You know how you're trying to capture that that child's line in some some ways. Can you talk a little about deciding to to go in that direction instead of you know I have to try to make this as carefully I crafted I didn't have a as choice. The, I don't draw that well. <laughs> There's that, but it's still it's not mutts looking. It's it's, no, it's no, a different no, it's vibe. Not it's looking. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's totally different. I yeah. mean, I literally just without penciling first and trying to make them perfect. I it was, you know, I get that feeling from your your early drawings. You know that you, you're just drawing. You don't really know what you're doing. That's that's. I joke that the early ones, if you look at them chronologically, it's like a stroke victim who's just starting <laughs> to get the the hand eye thing back, and he's figuring yeah. out how to draw. And then within six or seven weeks, like, oh wow, he made great progress with this this rehab. Um, except that turned out to be you know me learning to look at stuff. But yeah, no, doing yeah. the the Marvel characters was just drawing for the sake of drawing. I wasn't. You know, the best art is when your mind's not involved, you're not thinking. And when I do that the Marvel stuff. That, that was my moment. Looking at the trees, yeah. that was my, hey, the voices are gone. Yeah. It's just it's just the eye and the hand. It's yeah. the, the, the brain is cut out right now, and it's it's just... Yeah. yeah. You know, I, that's why I love to paint. I mean, painting, that always happens, because I don't have any... Um, I don't have any attitude about it. It's just I'm making a mess. I'm having fun. Yeah. And... Uh, and there's, I mean, there's still that when I draw mutts, but there's also all that, you know, uh, baggage that comes with that, you know, trying to make it right and telling a story and like, you know, there's, you, you're thinking, but just doodle in the Marvel superheroes, I, I am not thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, was there one that people wanted more than anything else or was it just up to you what you were going to no, draw? No, I asked everybody okay. who, the, who their favorite character was uh, and I told them it had to be someone from the 60s because I got a lot of Wolverines and yeah, I'm not going to draw Wolverine. Um, I got a lot of Spider-Mans. Spider-Man, I guess. It's a good, yeah, regular for that. everybody. And he's fun to draw. He's, he's, he's easy and fast. But, um, and for one guy, I, I did that and it was the best drawing of the, the weekend was uh, that this did go thing of Spider-Man where it's half Peter Parker. And oh, yeah. Because he wanted Peter Parker and I said, I'm not going to draw Peter Parker. Oh. So I, I did the half Peter Parker, half Spider-Man, which turned out to be, I wish I did it in the book. It would have been funny. Yeah. That can be your next uh, <laughs> handout or postcard you do with the, uh, the the book. But did you have that sense when you were a kid of, of a sort of reverence, not just towards the comics, but to like the Kirby and, and Ditko 
I will joke that, you know, also Don Heck, who you, you include in the book, but, you know, but, but mainly Kirby and Ditko and, and, and the art. You know, Don Heck's like, funny when we were kids. We, I mean, we, I think, I don't really remember if we knew the names, but we knew the art. Like, we knew yeah. which books looked good and which books didn't. And, uh, boy, nothing against Don Heck, but when we were kids. He just so wasn't <laughs> Kirby and Ditko. That, we, there's just a bar that was yeah, up that here. was a disappointment when the Avengers was now Don Heck. But, you know, now... Uh, you know, getting older. Now I look at those Don Hex with the same appreciation. Appreciation, yeah. Like that was my youth, and they were fun. And uh, so I, my appreciation of Don Heck has gone up. Um, but as a kid, I think it was just intuitively knowing that this this looks great, mm-hmm. you know, and that the storytelling was better. Mm-hmm. Do you feel you got the book you wanted out of out of this? Yeah, I know you didn't have a vision for what it was going to be going in. I, you know, I have to, it's, it was the most fun book I ever did, and yeah. it's going to sound crazy. I, I look at it every day. I just, it is, it's, I don't even feel like I did it. I feel like someone else did it, and it's yeah. a fun book to read. <laughs> have you ever had that vibe with your art? The... With my paintings, yes. Okay. But on not, occasion, a, not a narrative, though. On occasion yeah. with Mutz, I make myself laugh. Yeah. Yeah. You have a no prize joke in the superheroes journey. I busted a gut laughing <laughs> with everything else that was going on, and just an old Marvel no prize envelope shows up. I was like, "Yeah, he he, he loved this work. It's it's it, he's thinking of it in many different layers and, and you know ways that it affects the universe." But but yeah, and, well, I and the no prize was the uh, the ultimate. Uh, you know the. The watcher talks about, I desire nothing, I want nothing. And I thought yeah. the no prize was the perfect yeah. example of that. It, it and, you know, my, my first children's book was The Gift of Nothing, yeah. where Mooch gives her all a, a box of nothing. And uh, so I thought the no prize, I had to get in there, I had to get in yeah. the book somewhere. <laughs> I, I was not expecting it. I, I laughed my ass off. <laughs> well, I hope that, everyone who listens to this has the book before they see it. Yeah, no, no we're spoilers. Gonna, we're we're going to give, give up too much all, We're going to give up all this. The book has a lot of surprises and... When I've shown it to people, I only show pages where I know there's no surprise on it. Yeah, it's 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 something I I, I mentioned on Instagram, which we, we talked about before recording. That the I'll say the the purposefulness that comes out of it, the the the, the purpose driven life, however you want to phrase it, is embodied and captured in, in this book in a way that I found incredibly moving. Um, and I, everybody who listens to this regularly knows I go through all sorts of crazy uh, uh, psychological, mental, emotional transformations. <laughs> but but there was this sense by the time I finished it of a, a, a sort of shifting inside me um, that it, it was kind of reframing how one sees the world and and how one sees all those those four color influences we had as kids, all the, the, the action adventure and heroics and things that meant one thing as, as children, seeing how it could, um, continue to feed us in ways that aren't fan service that aren't mm-hmm. just about, Oh, I want more of my superheroes. You know, this was, was taking something in a direction that felt incredibly personal to you, but to me reached out and, and, you know, again, kind of helped reset my brain. Um, so wow. thank you. For, well, for that. that, that, that makes my day. I mean, I, I, I see the book as a spiritual book disguised as a Marvel comic, yeah. <laughs> which I'm amazed I got away with. Hey, they, they did that Pope strong. John Paul book back in the eighties. <laughs> uh, Marvel's got a history with this. I'm just <laughs> but no, no, it is no, very uh, much. I my reading table is mostly I read comic books and I read spiritual books, and this this book was an opportunity to mesh the things that are in my brain and put them on paper. So, uh, you know, the, the it has my favorite. Panel, a lot of my favorite panels and pages from Kirby and Lee, but the book also has some of my favorite quotes from all yeah. the spiritual books I read, and it's a it's a nice mashup of those yeah. two things. And uh, you know, again, going back to the Watcher, I mean, I mean, the Watcher's just you know, Jack Kirby was definitely a very strong spiritual person, and uh, you know, the Watcher is perfect. I mean, he's the witness, you know, yeah. the uh, changeless witness to the uh, changeful mind. <laughs> and we always put not interfere in quotes throughout yes. the book because <laughs> he's kind of interfering, but yeah, know, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. It just visually, he reminded me of my, my late friend Tom Spurgeon a little bit with some of the, the gesturing and stuff. I'm like, that's kind of a Tom vibe. And Tom served that purpose too for us. And that was, you know, uh, part of what made it beautiful. But um, 
Well, what was more intimidating, the working with with Kirby and Ditko material or working with the Dalai Lama on your, your previous <laughs> book, Heart to Heart? I would say the Dalai Lama. I, the, uh, you don't want him mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Kirby and Dicko were just old friends. I, I felt like I was playing with friends. I mean, yeah. between the characters and Kirby's work and Dicko's work and Lee's work, I really feel like I was just playing with old friends. And I knew I wouldn't do anything to, um, you know, that I was going to be uh, Rever reverent. reverent. Yeah. But not, not undercutting or not. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. No, I mean, I loved yeah. this stuff too much. I knew I wasn't going to put it in a bad light. I mean, if anything, it's it's a love letter to Jack Kirby. You know, it really is a love letter to all those great comics. And God, when you think the amount of work those guys did. I mean, I did, more than ever, I was blown away by the, the quality, but the uh, quantity, yeah. you know, that they just... Jack Kirby, what a brain. I mean, page after page. Yeah, you think of all the costumes he came up with, all the concepts he came up with, all the characters. He, I mean, it's like 50 artists' worth of uh, yeah. material. I, and also just the work. I mean, when I was looking, you know, there'd be a, you know, a random panel and a random page and a random book. And when he draws New York City, there's like, you know, 30 buildings in the background, and yeah. each one's different. Like, who the hell does that? <laughs> You know, jeez. Or and just, same with Dick. I mean, Dick go the same way. Yeah. The amount of detail in just random panels, and they weren't getting paid that much money back then. You know, so it's it's amazing how uh, the quality of all their work, and that that's why people love it. It's, yeah. You know, it stands still stands the test of time. I look at that run of Fantastic Four from like number forty to number sixty, and it's the. Just and that was just one of probably seven other books he was doing. Yeah, just yeah. knocking out, oh, here's the Inhumans, here's a Silver Surfer, here's yeah. Galactus, here's Black Panther, just one after another. Just, yeah, whatever, just keep them going. Yeah. Um, I don't think we talked about it in 2017. Um, where do you stand on Jack versus Stan or Jack in concert with Stan? <laughs> <laughs> Jack and Stan. Are, you know, are now, now that I'm officially uh, part of, Marvel, part of so the Marvel Universe, I don't know if I, <laughs> if I talk about it, they might not let me do another book. Um, let me just say that... Uh, they needed um, each other. Well, Maybe. you know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to. All right, obviously, I'm a Jack Kirby nut, yeah. and uh, but I will say for Stan and, and doing the book, you know, even made it more uh, evident to me was uh, you know, his showmanship. But like, was part of the the joy of that stuff. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll give him a hundred percent credit for that. The letter pages, the silly things they said on the front of the books. You know, yeah. uh, <laughs> this is the one that. Um, I'm going to blow it. This is the one that uh, said couldn't be done, and we almost didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just this, this silly, great stuff. And you really, I mean, as a kid, part of it was not only that the stories were great, you felt like you were part of a yeah. secret yeah, club. Sure, it was a club. And, yeah. yeah, and the genius of doing that, I mean, that's part of the joyous memories I have, you know. So uh, I'll give him all the credit for that. He just made it totally fun to be part of that world. Yeah, for those of us, and again, I came to this stuff 10 years later. I'm reading in the, the Fantastic Four in the early 70s, mid 70s uh, onwards. And it was still that sense of you're in, well, at the time you're in comics, therefore you're a social outcast and a pariah. <laughs> and it meant something that there was this, you know, this code and this, this sense of a, a world that, you know, we all shared. But, but yeah, just... It's a different age than when you know, everybody is going nuts about the next Marvel movie, although that apparently is now kind of subsided a little bit post-pandemic. But but yeah, the world where comics became super accepted was a very strange one for me to be living in. But, you know, it's, it's, it's just never being shoved wait, into lockers wait, as you know, a kid. The comics that I have in here and the comics I'm writing about and remembering... Um, I was young enough, you didn't have any of those thoughts. In yeah, your head. I was just reading comics and they were fun. <laughs> but tell me about the Dalai Lama then, working with... a. Uh, with him on heart to heart, and it's, how that contrasts with <laughs> with the superhero's journey. We'll, we'll veer back and forth over these things because uh, it's it's sure, but that, that shows you it, it's a small world. I mean, the fact that some guy from Jersey did a book with the, the, the Dalai Lama it still is hard to believe. Um, that was just a happy accident. That yeah. was um, you know I was on the board of the Humane Society for many years. And when a fellow board member was putting a trip together to go to Africa, so the Dalai Lama book actually started in Africa. Yeah. And uh, he invite, he was going with a group of his friends, and he invited me and Karen if we'd like to go. And, boy, we had the privilege and not to go to Africa in 2000. And uh, 
boy, if you haven't gone to Africa, it's it's a life changing trip for sure. And Karen's been wanting to go back ever since, so we she couldn't say no to that. And so I had to catch up on my deadline, and we went to Africa. And out there, we uh, got friendly with his wife, Pam, who uh, sits on the board of the International Campaign for Tibet. Hmm. And while we were in Africa, we were talking a lot about the uh, fragility of the world and, you know, how crazy humans are to destroy so much beauty. And she was talking about the, that that's like, a, you know, a big mission in the Dalai Lama's life now, the environment and, you know, saving the environment. And she knew much, and she particularly liked the book I did with Eckhart Tolle, uh, Guardians yeah. of Being. And she was talking about that book. And, of course, Karen, my wife, said, well, Patrick could do a book with his holiness, if, if, you, if you think. <laughs> and she said, that's a great idea. So she went back to the board at the International Campaign for Tibet and suggested it. And uh, on the board is the Dalai Lama's niece. And she liked the idea, and she lives in Washington, D.C., and actually knew much. <laughs> and so they presented it to uh, the Dalai Lama and his people, and they came back and said, sure. Yeah. So that's how it happened. And then coming up with the the text for it and developing your well, you know, illustrations I, around it. I um, started looking at all his quotes about the environment to get an idea of what could this book be. And they were, like, so powerful and... Uh, you know, I, I knew I just didn't want to illustrate quotes that I thought a story, you know, uh, you know, Jane Goodall really sums it up. Jane, Jane Goodall was asked, how do you change people's hearts? You know, how do you change people's minds? And she said, it's really tough to change people's minds, but you, you have to change their hearts. And you do that by telling stories. Mm -hmm. So I knew it, the Dalai Lama book, I didn't want it just to be a book of quotes, but to, to tell some kind of story. So um, I started putting those quotes together. Unfortunately, uh, this was 2019. Yeah. <laughs> like everything, the plan was that we were going to go out to uh, Dharamsala and meet with the Dalai Lama and discuss the book. And then, you know, COVID hit and that got put on hold. So we did everything via emails. And, uh, you know, I presented some art to him and showed him the idea of having the idea of him having a discussion with the pan, you know, that a panda bear sees his environment disappearing and wants answers. So he figured who, who, what human could he ask? Yeah. And I thought the Dalai Lama would be a good person to ask. So that, that's basically the story of the Dalai Lama uh, having a discussion with this panda bear about, about our planet. And, uh, you know, so there was some back and forth, and uh, the, book, the, book happened. the book happened. I'm very disappointed you guys didn't connect via Zoom, because anything that could involve the term Zooming with the Dalai Lama, <laughs> I would have just, well, that's clearly the next book. You have to find some way of... of... Well, you know, I finally did um, just this April. Uh, instead of going there before the book, I got to go there after the oh, book. Yeah, and, I saw on your and, blog. Yeah, yeah, present a copy to him. So, uh, so we did finally get to meet, which was... got really powerful and moving and uh, yeah can you talk about that a little just you know we it was nice we went with the international campaign for tibet and her and her, the niece is the uh you know the president of the board and uh so we were there with her and um so we spent 10 days in dharmsala and we got to really meet all the tibetan people are so so wonderful i mean mm -hmm. god you think all the the hell they're going through with China, and uh, they're still like his, a lot of they were like His Holiness, you know, just uh, always have a smile and uh, great sense of humor, and just super positive, and, and obviously totally spiritual, and just great people. So we got to meet the Dalai Lama's oracle, the yeah. guy, the guy who uh, you know predicts the future and stuff, and he was just a the nicest guy and I presented a book to him and he said oh I'm an artist too and he did a little drawing for me so I got a little drawing from the <laughs> Dalai Lama's oracle and uh, it was just uh, and, you're, and you're up in the Himalaya mountains it was, it was really powerful but meeting the Dalai Lama himself you know so we got to spend like 10-15 minutes with him and um, I presented the book and uh, he didn't talk much he, he smiled a lot 
and held my hand. And Karen, my wife, got to hold his hand the whole 10 minutes. He just held Karen's hand the whole 10 minutes. And, uh, you know, when I was there, you're kind of in a state of disbelief and just you know, trying to be in the moment. But when I walked away, man, I, I, I was on another plane of existence for yeah. about 15 minutes. I was just, I mean, the only way I could describe it is I didn't have a thought in my head. <laughs> the, the best the best place to be yeah. and just a smile on my face and that lasted about 15 minutes so you really uh it was a moving experience for me yeah mm -hmm. tell me about drawing in that book as opposed to to superhero's journey and, and other work because i found myself since i started drawing a couple of years ago um looking so much more intently at a i'll say the sim not simplicity but the, I'll say minimal uh, approach you took to the to heart to heart that I found absolutely it, it walloped me because I tend as you've seen from looking at my stuff I tend to overwork uh, <laughs> one of the things is I don't know when to stop because I'm nuts um, but there were these just beautiful moments of, of stillness and there's just enough blades of grass that are shown <laughs> it, it doesn't have to be the entire the entire field um, you know, settling on the, the visual style that you used for that book. And then, of course, how do I get better as an artist? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm from the less is more school. Yeah. And I really believe cartooning, not all cartooning, my cartooning, you know, it's really about, I feel like, we're, you know, I did a book with Daniel Ladinsky, the poet, yeah. and it's, it's a book of kind of a haikus. And I feel like doing a comic strip is like doing a haiku. It's really getting down to the essence of, you know, like keep on wood, like a sculptor, just you whittle, whittle away, whittle away, whittle away until you're left with the essence. You know, what, what's the most important? What's the least you can do to tell the most? So that's always the, the way I've handled mutts. I mean, if you look at mutts, it's, it's amazing. Like you said, just like a few blades of grass gives you a place. Yeah. You know, when they're in the house, you know, a, a frame on the wall and half of a chair, and, right. and you know where you are. I mean, I mean, boy, look at Peanuts. You know, he was he was the master of that. Like, there's so little background, so little drawings, but there's, you know, to me, it's all about emotion. Mm -hmm. You know, what I try to draw is emotion, and I don't know how to teach that. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how I do it myself, to tell you yeah. the truth. And I think all the artists that I love, you know, it's not how great they draw, not their anatomy or their cross hatching. It's like you know, that the characters are alive on the page. And how do you do that? How does that happen? I mean, that's what drew me to comics as a kid. I mean, my earliest memories is my mom collected Pogo books and Jules Pfeiffer books. So I can remember being like a three-year-old flipping. Yeah, I couldn't read them, but I just... Was, but two of 20th century's greatest yeah, artists. And, and, and the me. movement and the, you know, how alive those characters were. Yeah. You know, just that, to me, that's the magic of comics. So... I don't think I'm a great artist, but I think I'm pretty good at capturing feelings and emotions. And that's, you know, with comics, it's all about storytelling. So how do you tell stories? It's with feelings and emotions. So with the Heart to Heart book, you know, I, I think I even thought more about what's the least I could. I mean, it's the Dalai Lama. I wanted his words, yeah. you know, and obviously it, it is what makes the book so powerful. So, you know, I wanted my drawings to be part of that but not you know say look at me oh, yeah. there's <laughs> nothing that's that's meant to be overwhelming there's nothing yeah. that's so intricate that you know, you're going to lose sight of, of the words on the page but again not again not the simplicity but, but the minimalist uh, of it just really got me uh, thinking about yeah, because I've had trouble getting back to drawing lately and I just had this maybe it just slow down and, and you know, just, just kind of let these, these, again, the blades of grass, the, the hint of a tree and, and everything else, you know, let those things start to come together and not overwork I, for the sake of, you know, some sort of mimetic. I will tell you a funny story about yeah. the heart to heart book. So, you know, I proposed it, it got approved, but then when I sat down to start thinking about how I was going to draw it, you know, the thought of, I have to draw the Dalai Lama. I mean, that, yeah. you know, I didn't have that feeling when I had to draw Captain America. <laughs> the Dalai Lama was like, oh, my God, how am I going to capture the Dalai Lama? And is he going to like it? And what, what am I going to do? So, you know, my, I started in my sketchbooks 
drawing and drawing. And after about two days of drawing, I went to my wife, Karen, and I said, geez, I wish his nose was bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I don't draw small noses. And it was really tough to, uh, to try to capture that. But I went out of my way to, uh, to draw a small, small nose and I, and I felt I had them, you know, I felt, felt like I had, again, again, I'm not a caricature. It's, it's, you know, it's not a great likeness, but I was trying to capture his energy. And, uh, so we had to, you know, get everything approved. So these, these early sketches we sent to his office and the note I got back was his nose is too big. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, my God, I don't know if I could draw a smaller nose than that. <laughs> just a little tiny dot that's cartooning, and that's, that's, you know. I was showing Amy on the drive down here, just the mountains in the background. Uh, I was like, they're, they're just two lines and yeah. a third line at another angle. That's a mountain, and it, it gets it all. There's a dot here that implies there's some rocks. That's that's cartooning the language. It, it's, it's, it's cartooning language and how the brain works. You yeah. know, you do two dots in the line and you see a face. Yeah. You know, we're always seeing faces everywhere. And you know, Scott McCloud is always posting yeah. just you know faces we see in in the world. You yeah, know, yeah. like a, a a plug outlet and the way it's angled. So, yeah, yeah. No, that's a dude's face. But. And also, I mean, I I totally love drawing animals, and you know, yeah. a big part of the book was getting to draw all these great animals and. Um, you know, that book, like the superhero book, those, none of those were pencil first. Those were all in state in, you know, spontaneous drawings. No, I, I hate I you to. even more. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you don't see all the pages that go in the garbage can. Oh, this is the same thing. When I, I recorded with Ed Sorrell, that was a, Ed sort of looking through my stuff and he knew which ones were straight to ink. He's like, yeah, yeah. keep doing those. Yeah. Don't worry about the pencils anymore, Gil. Just, <laughs> just, just draw with a pen. I'm like, yeah, there's, there's a do or die. Yeah. Here and you know this one died. Throw it out, but you know go on to the next one and the next one and, and yeah. yeah. I was talking with a friend who um, she sent me an article from a, a New York Times tech writer who taught himself to draw by using Procreate with a, a photo on the the screen and he would just draw over the trace, trace. trace. Yeah, and trace it was, that's it. how he was learning. She's like, "Do you feel like that's cheating?" I'm like. Listen, it's not what I did, <laughs> but God knows I was just going in the backyard and looking at trees. So it's not like this is some great tutorial for the world. If it got him learning what, what shapes are like and how to convey things, more power to him. You know, you get away from tracing and start dealing with the horror of the blank page. That's great. But I said the one thing I disagree with, for me, doing anything digital, I'm like, I don't like being able to undo stuff. Yeah, I like the destruction. Uh -huh. That line is there. That line's going to be there, and you better do something with it, and and or throw it out and, and come up with something else. But you know, the the to me the the paper um, and 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 the line is kind of the finality of it. I guess matters. Yeah. Um, well, I'm still a luddite with all that stuff. I don't. Yeah, it's for totally the best. Used to compare, but you know, thank God for my brother Robert. I mean, the superhero's journey. That's, that's a lot of computer stuff to combine my stuff with their stuff. I didn't, I, you know, I, I was lucky. I got to say, make that happening. Yeah. <laughs> Between Sean, the uh, art director, and my brother Robert, who helped with that, he, they made it happen. So yeah. that I mean, was this pleasant. page. It's got to go this side. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, again, it, it, the integration is beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's you know, again, these are panels that I wasn't reading when they were coming out, but for me, it was all the reprints of those superhero comics was. It was super important because I was reading the next generation stuff, all the, yeah. the 70s comics and seeing what came after. When you see all the precursors and the origins of the Fantastic Four and all these things and what those Kirby comics were like, um, because you couldn't get this stuff. And as a little kid, of course, the, the originals were priced out of, a, mm -hmm. out of mind. But, but yeah, it's, it's like well, I said. I, I feel very lucky because my childhood, and that's what the book's you know, partly about, but... Yeah. Uh, you know, to wait a month to see what happens with Galactus. I mean, that, that was that was my childhood, you know? No binging back then. It's, it's a, yeah. And people say that now with Comixology, you can read everything that they've ever published. Yeah. It's four ninety nine. I'm like, I just... It's on an iPad. I'm used to, to having a comic that's falling apart in my hands. Yeah. That's, that's, you know... And that, that opening, you know, the, 
double page spread of you know me looking at the comics on the rack. When I when I think of the comics I saw on the rack, it's just <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, you know? I will say anytime there's a movie or anything that like shows older times in like a comic store or drugstore, you know it's instantly like freezing the frame and just trying to <laughs> yeah. identify. It's the same thing I do in, in anybody's home. It's always yeah. like, oh, let me look at the bookshelves and see exactly what's there yeah. and who they are. But but yeah, you can date everything by figuring out what you know. Well, that's from 1965. And, you know. <laughs> But yeah, it's. Uh, I think the two books together work beautifully. In those, I'm sure it wasn't intended in the slightest. Two different publishers, etc., yeah, to, yeah. to have them come out the same year. Yeah, for for me, it was a good year to have a Dalai Lama book and a Marvel superhero book. If you would have told me that four years ago, who believed that? Now I will say, four years ago, uh, we were going to talk. Yeah. Because the 25th anniversary book of of Mutz, The Art of Nothing, was coming out. But it's okay. We'll just get together in 2020 sometime. <laughs> Yeah. Which now brings us to late 2023. Um, we're closer to the 30th anniversary of Mutz. A year away. Yeah. yeah. How does that feel? <laughs> Crazy. Ooh, yeah. dude. Time goes too fast. Time goes way fast. Uh, you know, I'm not, but you know, when I think Sparky did 50 years, and you know, I, I'm guessing Bill Griffith must be close to 50. 37, 38. I th- oh, he started in the 80s. So I would make him 40. Yes, yeah, it's, it's like 39 years, I think he said. Wow. It's, it's almost uh, 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 40 years of wow. Zippy. It's amazing. Uh, of Zippy strips. He's been doing yeah, yeah, earlier Zippy, Zippy stuff in the 70s. Sure. But, but yeah. yeah. No, it's... Uh, that of all comics to just to yeah. continue in newspapers all this, this yeah. time is... A, yeah, that is that something. That is amazing, yeah. I mean, yes, Mutz is a great <laughs> achievement. Zippy's a weird achievement <laughs> to, to keep going. It's, it's tremendous. But yeah, tell me, you know, thinking that... 30 years of... of well, you know, the comic strip industry is a weird industry. You, I mean, that you're allowed to do that. How many art industries can you do the same thing for that long? But that's part of, you know, most comics do last forever. You know, I yeah. mean, the successful ones could last, you know, past a lifetime. Yeah, you know, the creator so passes away and then his kid takes over, you know. Yeah. So they just go on and on and on. I, I never thought about it, but... Um, you know, I was hoping this strip was going to be successful, and I thought I'd be doing it for a few years. I didn't know if I was going to be doing it for 30 years, though. Yeah. How do you keep it fresh? We'll just make it really blunt. And, and, you know, <laughs> how do you keep making mutts? You know, I, I still love comics. I still love telling stories. Um, I tell you, recently, just, just the last year, I feel like it, it, it got a new... I have a new uh, zest for it, yeah. you know. I mean, I have to admit, I mean, I'm sure it's, if you ask any cartoonist, you know, there were years where, or times where, I mean, it's always been fun. Yeah. But, uh, but you don't feel as... Yeah, you don't feel... You look back yeah, and say, it's not, I wasn't as inspired. Yeah, you uh, do something for 30 years. And, and I, honestly, I think if you look at all the, the great cartoonists, there's years that aren't as good as other years, and it's just life, you yeah. know, like, you don't know what happened to that, because... That was part of my, my Bill Griffith conversation about Ernie Bushmiller. He he got some scrapbook of 62 to 64 yeah. uh, Nancy strips. And they're not everything, because as he puts it, you're not putting out the greatest hits 365 days no, a year. You, <laughs> you know, yeah. there's some good ones. Eh, some of them didn't work quite as well. But yes, yeah. yeah. Sparky used to say it's like baseball. If you're hitting 300, yeah. you're a superstar, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, boy, just the last year or so, I... Uh, I have a new little, it's been a little more fun for me just in the last year, for whatever reason. Yeah. Do you see that? Um, well, how do you characterize it? Do, do you feel it's just, it's become more fun? The drawing has become more fun? You, you, you feel know, I, something I different? change things up a little bit. I'm using different paper, uh, different pen. Um, you know, for a while there, I wasn't lettering. And I just, to do all these other projects, I sure. just, the lettering just took up too much time and I, and uh, so I kind of gave that to my brother, did the lettering for me. But now I'm back to doing the lettering, and it just, it just and a little burst of energy. I mean, I saw that with Sparky. You know, I, I feel like the last two years of his work, he, I could tell that he was yeah. having fun again. Yeah. And not that you're not having fun those other no, years, no, but, no, but it, yeah, we yeah, know it, what it's goes, like. it goes up and down. Yeah. 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 In his case, there was the 
seeing the finish line. I mean, it was for, for an outside observer, it didn't seem like there was a sense that he, he saw the finish line coming. Yeah, maybe. Um, that it was... Jeez, maybe I'm seeing the finish yeah, line so I didn't coming. want to say that because I was afraid you were going to go in that direction. But, but it's like when I, I, I recorded with, with uh, Harold Bloom up at Yale, uh, 2015, and I thought I was just getting Harold being Harold, and apparently, according to, to his friends, like, no, you... You, you found the fastball again for, for your conversation. I'm like, oh, I just thought this is what he does with everybody. He's like, no, no, he kind of geared up and really, you know, started to, to get the energy back, um, which is weird because, again, I'm just some schlub from New Jersey. But, but talk a little about the the contrast of doing books. Well, and sometimes you have to to slow down on the daily strip. But you know how how books and strips differ for you. I guess. I mean, I know there's a lot more that goes into production and design and everything, but. Uh, you know, when you do a strip for 30 years, you know, there's a routine to it. And also, you know, you have basically most of the time, three panels, the same tools, the same, you know, mm. so to me, the, the books, you know, I get to flex my creative muscle. I mean, I yeah. get to do things I can't do in the strip. I mean, God, you look at the superhero's journey. I mean, I'm using colored pencils and giant six foot paintings and, uh, you know, you get to play. It's a little more play. I mean, this, the, the comic strip will always be play, but it's also, there's it's definitely like constraints. A, yeah, and yeah. it's every day. So th there is a definitely a mechanical work aspect to it that's hard to not be part of the, the process. Sure. Where the, the paintings and the books are definitely more play. You know? Does that freedom ever seem intimidating? The, oh no! Okay. I, I crave it. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I keep coming up with excuses not to work. So that's that, that's good. No, no, no. I, I, are you kidding? You need I, that offset. I'm, offsetting I'm, the. Uh, I'm the happiest in my studio painting. I mean, uh, painting only began for you in in 2016. You know, I've, painted, I've painted since college. I, okay. When I went to SVA, I only took a few illustration classes. I took more fine art classes, and um, off and on, I've painted over the years. Doing a daily comic strip. You know, I went quite a few years not painting because there just wasn't the time for it. But um, when I bought this house, I, I was looking for a, a building that could be, you know, so this is um, we're in the pool house, which I turned into my painting studio. Um, but I was looking for that because I definitely wanted to paint again. This is again. the glamorous life of uh, syndicated yeah. cartoonists, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then when the pandemic hit, also there was time. Yeah. You know, so I started painting then. Mm. And it started out with just huge abstract paintings. You know, I'm so used, I don't know, you know, my Mutz originals are very small. I, I, I drew my, you know, like the dailies are three inches by nine and three quarter inches. That's pretty small. Wow. And, you know, they're, they're clean and tight. And uh, so it was just really fun to do like six foot paintings that were just messy. Mm -hmm. And I did those for quite a while, and then I realized that uh, they're just abstract paintings. What do they mean? They look nice, but what do they mean? And, uh, and I wasn't showing them to anybody. The only person that saw them was Karen. And uh, then I thought it would be fun to have people in the painting looking at my painting. And I decided on Nancy and Sluggo, because Ernie <laughs> Bushmiller does the back of their heads a lot. Yeah. So I'm an expert on the back of Ernie, <laughs> Nancy and Sluggo's head. Did you get the correct number of little bristles or stubs you coming know, out of her? No, it's funny. Head? That was I read that in um, I guess Mark Newgarden's book. Yeah. yeah. Um, but before I read that, I, that was the biggest pain in the ass of the pain. <laughs> Just I getting mean, the little how stubs coming stubs? out. Yeah. Sixty-nine or one hundred and seven. Yeah, Bill I said in his that. book. I didn't either. But, I just yeah. did as many of that would fit, but uh, it was like one of the worst part of doing the paintings. I kept it for the. It was the last thing I did because it was a pain in the neck. And then I think I read in Mark's book that it was the last thing Ernie did, and it was a pain in the neck. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so then I drew these paintings with Nancy, it, and then I added Milk Grook, some Milk Grook, the father from Milk Gross's, uh nice baby, mm -hmm. who is just this guy who always got physically and mentally abused and beaten. And I think between uh, the politics <laughs> and the <laughs> pandemic, that's how I felt. So I didn't even realize I picked them for that reason. But after looking at the paintings, I was like, oh, yeah, that's what we're all going yeah, through. It turns out everything's <laughs> permeating my brain right now. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I started doing the Marvel 
And then all of a sudden I started painting, adding Marvel characters to my paintings. I remember you had someone I visited in 2017, because I remember there was the the Spider-Man cover with the Molten yeah. Man, that great, you know, predominantly black cover with this yeah, gold yeah, yeah. figure and all that. And I was like, yeah, that's one of my first okay, that's, that's, oh, okay, that's, that's, yeah. yeah. So actually when, when I got approached by Charlie about doing the Marvel book, I, that was another thought. I was like, man, how can I get some of my paintings in this yeah. book? So all the paintings that are in the book were done before I even had the opportunity to do the book, but they, they worked with the storyline. So, yeah. 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 Tell me about trying to capture that Kirby energy. Because we've looked at a few where you've got the, the Avengers fighting the Hulk mm -hmm. sort of thing. And just the that Kirby energy, that, that kinetic <laughs> force, you know, what did you, I guess, what did you learn from just trying to reproduce those, even in this is large scale for the, these paintings? I don't know if I learned it, but I mean, I knew it. He was just, you know, he was just a master at showing motion and energy and uh his compositions are just perfect yeah. just perfect every, every one of them is perfect and again these little tiny panels yeah it's, it's not drawing that much bigger you know for his yeah his... no his genius was i mean everything was his genius but they're they're like perfect compositions but then also he knew how to tell a story i, I mean i, I kind of you know gave up on comics later because i just felt like even though the art was really really splashy and you know beautifully inked and everything that the storytelling was disappearing, you know, that, and that he was for all the dyna, you know, dynamic drawings he did. He also really paced the stories so well. Um, so doing the paintings, you know, I just reconfirmed how how great he was with that stuff. And have the paintings changed for you over time, over a couple of years? Did you notice changes in what you were doing? Well, you know, at first I was. Um, Actually, you know, for the Ernie Bushmiller stuff and the Milk Rose yeah. stuff, I was literally copying their work exact. And it was a yeah. nice combination of my 1940, 50 abstract paintings with the tightness of those guys. But now with the new Marvel paintings I'm doing, I'm doodling them the way I doodle in the book. You know, now I'm just doing my version of them. And it's 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 been a lot more fun. Yeah. Did you ever want to be comic artist? I mean, comic book. You know, maybe for a, a month or two, but I was smart enough as a kid to know my chops were there. <laughs> <laughs> you do have, in, in the superhero's journey, you include the, the comics you and your brothers yeah. were, were yeah. the characters you and your brothers were. Yeah, I mean, were. as a little kid, I, I did dream about that, but I think when I started getting more serious about art, I, I knew I didn't have that, uh, you know, I've... You know, at the same time reading the Marvel stuff, I was also reading Peanuts. And then at 13, I discovered Crazy Cat. And those spoke to, to me personally stronger yeah. than the... Uh, I mean, for how much I love the Marvel, just my personal abilities and my personality, you know, I knew I wanted to do something that was more like Crazy Cat than, yeah. than uh, Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something... Uh, I mean, I drew funny and I drew loose, so I knew that that was a smarter route than trying to draw as well as Ditko and Kirby. I knew that I knew that wasn't going to happen. Yeah. It's well, I have a whole story about showing Gary Panter some reprints back in the '90s that Marvel was doing of horror and I think science fiction comics. Uh, there were for, uh, reprints from the '50s of like Kirby, Ditko, mm -hmm. and Wolverton, and, and all that, and it's just. Same thing. Completely disposable, you know, comics at the time. And yet, you know, every panel just burned itself into Gary's brain. <laughs> and it's just, you, you see it all coming out in other work of his. And it's, it's like, yeah, these are the, the, the things that matter to us. But, you know, you have to understand how to how to use this stuff, I guess, in, uh -huh. in, in, as your own art. But, but tell me about showing in 2021, exhibiting this stuff and, and actually having... Um, an I, audience uh, that is not Karen looking at your paintings. <laughs> you know, it's so much fun. You know, I was doing these paintings for, you know, the whole pandemic years for like three years with no one seeing them at all. And they, boy, they, they piled up. I, I have over a hundred paintings, like in two years, three years. Just don't will them all to Chris Ware like Jerry Moriarty <laughs> said that time. Okay. And, uh, you know, my, my little studio is not that big. So I, the opportunity of this you know, uh, Jenny Robb at Ohio State, you know, I thought when we talked about doing a show that we were talking about the Billy Ireland Museum, which, you know, is just 
the greatest museum, but you know, not not that big. But she said, oh, no, there's another space that Ohio State owns, uh, another gallery space. And she thought they always wanted to do a show there. So, I mean, it was this, you know, just a huge, they were able, they showed like 70 of 60, 70 of my paintings. So that, to have all that in one place, mm -hmm. I don't know what other people thought, but for me, <laughs> it was a lot of, it was just great to see all that, all that art in one spot. Yeah, you know, I, I never saw it like that before, and uh, yeah, that was great. Yeah. Did you watch people looking at your stuff? You, well, you know, it was still during the pandemic, so yeah, we, wasn't sure if we did get. They only allowed X amount of people at the gallery at the time, but uh, yeah, no, it got a really good response. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, I would just have the mental breakdown of of you know. Watching other people, yeah, not so good if they were looking at my stuff, which I know you you masked really well when you were going through my sketchbook. But <laughs> <laughs> I do like the fact that when we're talking about the minimalism of heart to heart, um, I I had this drawing of a couple of shrubs in my yard without any other decoration around them, and that was the one you that jumped out at you when you were flipping through. I'm like. That's the exact one I was thinking of when I was reading Heart to Heart, that this is the only instance <laughs> where I kept it under control and didn't go overboard. So, yeah, it's um, but one thing I'm curious about. And again, it, it goes back to talking to Bill Griffith a few weeks ago. The um, you're approaching 30 years. How has the art in Mutz changed? Do you find your tighter, looser? What's easier? What, what's more difficult? for you you know uh when you do a daily work of art it's it's funny how it evolves and you don't even know it's evolving. Yeah. you know yeah, you most just, artists don't until they look yeah. back at 15 years earlier and oh my god i was drawing it like that but yeah, yeah. And, and it's yeah. not it's never a plan you never sit down and say i'm gonna you know uh change the way snoopy looks and all of a sudden you're there and all of a sudden snoopy looks different you know yeah. uh you know, with, with with sparky you know it's funny he there's a her of of Snooper where he said, why did I draw him? Like he was mad at himself. You know, it was that, <laughs> I forgot what years it was, but he, he kind of got really thin and, and longer. Hmm. And he, and he looks at that and said, how did that happen? Which is, you know, just proof of you don't, you just do it. Not yeah. even aware of what, of what you're doing. So, uh, you know, I look at the early, the really early mutts and it's like, I couldn't, it's funny that I know I couldn't reproduce that. Yeah. Like here, or you know, shaggier by, yeah, by far. Well, but, the whole yeah. thing just had a much looser look, and I love it. But I think if you know, here I'm the artist that did it. But if you put a piece of paper in front of me, say draw much like you did in the first year, I don't think I could do it. I mean, yeah. I know I couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, which is really strange when you think about it. Yeah, that's what I wonder. <laughs> like, what do you see? How do you see your art changing like that? And what things happen subtly uh, over time? Because my thing with Bill was. I assume artists get older, they're going to get looser and lazier. He's like, no, it's you get tighter opposite. and tighter it's, and tighter. It's the like, opposite. And I didn't understand that before I started uh, uh -huh. my own drawing. I'm like, oh, no, I, I get, you know, even... I, you, know, it, yeah. you, you get tighter and the characters get chunkier. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like old age. You get a little fatter, you know. Um, I mean, if you look at Crazy Cat... You know, the, the really early stuff, which I is my favorite, you know, it just has such a loose look to it. But then if you look at the later stuff, everyone's like heavy on the page. And the same with Peanuts. If you look at the later Peanuts, everyone's a little, I don't know, when I say heavier, just more solid yeah. and, and yeah. a little bigger. And I saw that happening in months. And one of the reasons I'm, I just, you know, said a while ago that I'm really liking this year and starting last year was I purposely was trying to make it loose again. Yeah. You know, I realized that, yeah, you draw them so much, they, they get tight and they, and they kind of get chunky, whatever. So just in the last year, I've, I've been, uh, much looser and I, I think the art looks better and I'm enjoying it more. Yeah. So I'm trying to break the mold of, uh, <laughs> yeah, the cartoon that just gets tighter and, and clunkier. It's still good. You know, it's just different looks. I mean, late crazy cat has a, you know, a beauty to it that's not in the early ones, oh, but yeah. it's definitely a, a you different feel. look. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, in, in The Art of Nothing, you talk about the, or you write about the writing process, the sitting on a park bench and coming up with two weeks of, of strips during pandemic. 
anything change or was it pretty much a, well, nobody else is out. I'm going to go out and hit oh, the yeah, park no, I still, bench. And, uh, I felt safe. Yeah. I, okay. I, I still went to a park bench and, and wrote Pretty, once. You know, yeah. If anything, you felt safer. Or nobody's yeah, yeah. going to come up to you and, and, and bother you or anything. Yeah. So. Where do you see your work going? And it's a way of saying, is there a next book, but also <laughs> just a, you know, the progress between the painting, the strips, the books. You know, it, it sounds like you love each of them. And I won't ask which ones you, you love the most because they all have their own value for you. But yeah, I probably should plan better, but I don't. It's sort Good. of like whatever happens, happens. Um, I'd like to do. I mean, obviously, I'm going to continue to paint. I haven't figured out how to make a living off of that. And that might be my next thing I think of is like, because right now they're just piling up in my studio. <laughs> and I don't, I'm getting, you know, to a point where they're. Are like really taken over the place. So I was afraid they're going to fall over on us. And <laughs> yeah, be killed by the thing. It's going to be terrible. <laughs> so trying to figure out a way to to sell those would would be fun. Um, and I do like books, and uh, you know, I would I would I probably wouldn't mind doing another Marvel book to tell you the truth. I, I don't know if that's the right thing to do, but I, I I enjoyed it so much, and I still feel like I'm in having it hasn't left my head yet. Oh Usually, no, the fact that it hasn't come out yet is is, yeah. is good that it's not dead to you that yeah. it still feels alive and you're you're yeah. yeah. And even you know doing these signings and just drawing the characters, like I'm still having a lot of fun with that. Uh, so that could be a possibility. I guess it depends if the book does well, whether I get another opportunity for that. And I'm open. I, I stay open to the universe. I wouldn't have thought I would do a Marvel book. I didn't think I would do a Dalai Lama book. So I'm just excited about what might be next. And I have no idea what it is. Before we go, you want to read the, the two Jack Kirby quotes we talked about oh, at the yeah, beginning? Sure. Of yeah, sure. I'm going to read the short version, which I used, and the long version, which is in the back. Sure. Okay, the short version I used on the first page of the book. Jack Kirby was once asked, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? His answer, love. Now, that was a condensed version of a longer, it was a phone conversation. And I'll read the whole phone conversation, which I have in the back of the book yeah. with the quote sources. Um, Greg Theakston was the interviewer. And Craig, Greg says, all right, if you could have one superpower, just one, what personal power would you like to have? Kirby says, well, uh, you mean, uh, and Greg says, yeah, comic book superpower. And Kirby immediately with an exclamation point says, love. And then Greg says, no, you already got that. Give me something you don't have. Would you like to fly? Would you like to throw bolts from your fists? Would you like to crawl walls? What would be fun for Jack Kirby? And Jack says, oh, uh, to be eternal and watch things develop. <laughs> and I just feel like, wow, he, he was the watcher, you know? And uh, the, the book ends with, with this quote by Jack. I had a guy die on me once during the war, and he looked up at me and he said, what the hell happened? What happened? And here I was, just a schmo from the east side of New York City, you know. And how do you answer the guy? I told him, you happened. See? And that was real. It got me to think how valuable human beings are. And at that moment, I discovered my own humanity. In that moment, I discovered everybody else's. Yeah, when I read that quote, I felt like I need to do something with that someday and like i had the opportunity to do that i made a beautiful book man yeah that's, oh, uh, thanks. Uh, sound weird crying over a jack kirby <laughs> comic but that's where i am at this point <laughs> in my life this was uh this is something i'm really thankful that you made oh so. that, that that means a lot to me and uh yeah i mean jack kirby's work was powerful and important to me and uh and I think it was because of the the love and spirituality that was the un, at the undertone of all that stuff. And I think that's what's at the un, you know the undercurrent of all great art. And uh, this book is kind of a, a love letter to that undercurrent that's under all the yeah, great you, art that you admire. And you bring your own to it. So oh, that's thanks. that's it was a marvel, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks so much for coming oh, on again, you. Patrick. And that was Patrick McDonald. Go to mutts.com, M-U-T-T-S, for all things Patrick. Um, you'll see the daily strip. 
books, uh, merchandise you can get uh, around Mutz and, and the other projects he's done and all sorts of other uh, Patrick Iana. And go get the superhero's journey out now from Abrams Comic Arts. It's a it's a marvel of a book. It's a wonder of a book. Uh, and go get uh, Heart to Heart, his wonderful book with the Dalai Lama, uh, and the Art of Nothing, his twenty five year Mutz retrospective, which is also from Abrams. And follow Mutz on Twitter and Instagram at Mutz Comics, all one word. Patrick's also got his own Insta feed at uh, underscore Patrick McDonald. I'll have links to all that in the show and episode notes for this one. And if you'll be in Princeton on October 28th, 2023, Patrick and I will be having a conversation about the superhero's journey at the Princeton Public Library. Hope you can make it. And you can support the virtual memory show by telling other people about it. Let them know there's this podcast that comes out every week featuring really great conversation with fascinating creative folks. You can also improve the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it and who you'd like to hear me record with or what movie or TV show or book or comic or music or piece of theater or art exhibition or whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. And you can do that by sending me an email, DM if we're connected on social, a postcard, letter, my mailing address is at the end of my weekly substack, uh, or by leaving me a message on my Google voice number, which is 973 869 nine six five nine that goes directly to voicemail so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me and messages can be up to three minutes long so you go longer than that you'll get cut off just call back and leave a second one. Oh, and let me know if it'd be okay to include your message in an upcoming episode of the show you might have something interesting to share with listeners but i'd never put that uh never put your audio in an episode without your approval so give me a call and let me know if it'd be cool to include in the show now, if you got money to spare or other resources, don't give it to me. I mean, I got a Patreon, I got a Substack with a paid tier, but it's the same as the the free one. But really, my day job treats me fine. My expenses are pretty minimal. Um, so really, if if you have money or other resources, give it to other people in need or, or help out institutions. With people, you can go through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Crowdfunder, and all those crowdfunding platforms. And when you go there, you'll find people in need of, of funds for uh, medical bills, veterinary bills, uh, car payments, rent, getting artistic projects off the ground, you know, whatever it is, you might be able to, to make a difference in their lives. And when it comes to institutions, I give to my local food bank every month. I make targeted election contributions because I'm a lobbyist, um, but I give sometimes to the Poor People's Campaign to Planned Parenthood and Women's Choice Funds and but what I mean is there are all sorts of things you can do with money to, to try to help build a better world. So, uh, you know, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 